Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, part of your day today with us. I am Victoria Hind. And I'm from the School of Accounting and Finance at the University of Waterloo. And a longstanding passion of mine is to spotlight amazing alums who are making an impact. And today in particular, I'm really excited to hear from two powerful leaders uh, that strive towards advancing gender equity through their initiatives and research. I'm very pleased to welcome alums Winnie Shi, co-president and CFO of In Transit BC, and Christine Weedman, professor of financial accounting at the school. So Winnie has over 23 years of experience working in the infrastructure industry through P3 models in Canada, US, and internationally. Prior to joining In Transit BC, Win, uh, Winnie was a partner at KPMG, providing financial advisory services and specialized in providing financial analysis and negotiation support for infrastructure projects. She has been named as one of the top 100 women in 2021 by the Women's Executive Network in the C-suite category and is a founder of the Women's Infrastructure Network. Christine is interested in researching financial reporting and governance issues, including the role of regulation on corporate fraud and the interpretation of accounting information by capital market participants. Uh, current projects examine gender bias, regulation, and aggressive financial reporting and disclosure strategies for restatement firms. Uh, Christine also supervises doctoral students, preparing them for academic careers in accounting. So thank you so much for joining us, Winnie and Christine, for a chat on advancing gender um, equality, equity. Uh, I touched on your professional journeys, but it would be really great to hear from you personally um, on what led you to where you are today in your career, uh, careers. Winnie, would you like to start? Oh, sure, I would love to. Um, so when I graduated back in 1996, um, you know, from the Masters of Accounting program, you know, I, I really didn't have a good idea what it is I wanted to do. Um, I was an articling student. I did I articled with KPMG and, and I knew that, um, you know, audit wasn't something that I was probably going to do long term. Um, but I, I really didn't know what career choices were out there. And I had it in my mind that I was going to go back to law school. You know, you watch a lot of the, the, the legal dramas and it's, it's very glamorous, much better than, than audit. And so I had in my mind I was going to go to law school and I was applying to LSAT. And because I was working for KPMG, I made the decision that I should go and find out actually what lawyers do, what do corporate lawyers do? I had really no idea. Um, and so I transferred to their financial advisory services practice. And in fact, I actually transferred to their forensic accounting practice, which was very interesting and I definitely worked with lawyers. But at that time, uh, KPMG's financial services, advisory services was relatively small and juniors were lent out to, to different uh, different, uh, you know, different groups. And so I was lent out within my first month or so working there to uh, the corporate finance practice. And what they were doing is they were working for a client who was trying to acquire an airport uh, through a public private partnership. And it was a 99 year lease. And, you know, the actual work I was doing is not that exciting. It was, you know, due diligence and looking at contracts and looking at financial projections and so forth. But I was absolutely fascinated that a private sector entity could actually quote unquote own a government asset and of course going through the course of due diligence realize there's there, there's revenue streams there's airline revenues airport revenues there's costs i think there was a bit of a capital expansion investment required you know private sector could go get a loan for that and the npv of those cash flows obviously becomes the bid price and they bid it to the government and i was fascinated by this. And so if you can imagine this 23 year old who would follow the partner around saying, has our client won the bid? And if they've won the bid, can I work on the project? I want to work on the financing. This is absolutely fascinating. Well, needless to say, I never went back to law school. Six months later, I actually transferred into the consulting practice that does infrastructure projects um, that actually transformed into the infrastructure advisory practice. And I had a fantastic career. I traveled all over the world working on airport projects, you know, South America, Caribbean, the Europe, uh, Asia. I worked on some of the first P3 projects, including the Highway 407 in Ontario, um, you know, most intense six months of my life, but being exposed to sort of the politics associated with it, the pressures, um, you know, I was involved in advising the government on some of the first P3 projects in Ontario. And then about 2002, 
I started flying up to Vancouver because BC started on their first P3 projects in transportation and I was involved in sort of advising and really got to see how the commercial terms evolved, how the projects got implemented. Um, and so, you know, it was a fantastic career and I spent a bunch of time in the US when they started their P3 program in a number of different states and, and see how that evolved in the, in the different models. So it was a very, very rewarding career, you know, completely by accident because of that one job that I got lent out to uh, as a junior and certainly after my second mat leave so I became partner at, at KPMG and after my second mat leave you know I sort of decided I can't really handle the the, the, the travel uh, with the family and stumbled upon this job which is in transit BC who actually is a private sector joint venture um, that manages Canada Line which is one of the first P3s that were done out in BC and so pairing my knowledge with uh, you know commercial structuring in P3 I I moved into a financial administration role, but actually it was a great time because um, the Canada Line, which is you know eight, ten years old now, uh, in operations was going through a whole bunch of contract changes, expansion, all that other stuff. We had to renegotiate certain terms of the contract, so I was able to use a lot of my knowledge structuring P3s in these negotiations. So that's how I ended up where I am today. Thanks so much, Winnie. And you know sometimes the the accidents, they end up being really great opportunities and that's always fantastic to hear about and always encouraging um, that you don't always have to have that exact plan and it will work out and you've had a very fruitful career and journey so far and that's really fantastic to hear. Um, Christine, would you be able to uh, kind of go over what your professional journey has been? Yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, like Winnie, I did my master's at Waterloo. I graduated in 1988 and ar articled at the uh, Deloitte, but I think the seeds were planted in my mind for an academic career while I was at Waterloo. And a couple things kind of helped me along the way. One is that my profs were just really excited about accounting. They just loved it. They were enthusiastic, uh, very inspiring. So that um, you know s made me start thinking about uh, that kind of a career. Um, and I remember one day um, studying for a midterm in the math building and it was I think a management accounting exam and I was trying to explain a concept to some of my classmates and I could see that they, they got it and I just remember feeling so uh, inspired that I could help people and I could explain something so that kind of put the teaching idea in my head and then uh, and Winnie you, you probably did the same at the time the master's program required that you write a, a thesis or a research paper and uh, so I worked with Bill Scott on <clears throat> my paper was looking at corporate social responsibility and profitability. And I kind of liked this idea of research. So that 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 sort of um, came together. And so I uh, finished up uh, my CPA at, at Deloitte, but was thinking probably an academic career would be better for me, in part because I like to be able to delve into problems deeper than you sometimes can when you're on billable hours and you've got to go, you know, just keep going and 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 not spend too much time, you know. Um, and so I ended up uh, going to Cornell University to do my PhD. And I was thinking about your question um, in light of kind of gender issues. And looking back, I realized that all of my professors and all of the committee members were male. So there were no mentoring um, there was no mentoring from from females during that program, but I did form two uh, strong uh, friendships with Carol Marquardt and Heather Wire. Both have gone on to become full professors at other universities, and I have co-authored with them over the over the years. And so that has been a really important part of my career, I think, whereas there wasn't a lot of senior mentoring, um, women of my generation kind of worked together and we, we helped each other. Um, I, at my first position was at William and Mary in Virginia, um, and then I wanted to come back to Canada. So I uh, went to the Ivy Business School for uh, seven years. And what was great about that uh, time was that they're a very case-oriented school. So it was like another education in the case method of teaching, which was great, but they didn't have a PhD program. So um, I wanted to 
continue building my research portfolio. So I ended up coming to Waterloo, where they do have a very robust research program. And I've been able to supervise doctoral students and, and really build my research program since being here. So that, that's been great. But another observation is even today, about 75% of our research faculty are male. Uh, so it still is a male dominated field and there are still issues associated with that. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly had a great career and uh, and have really, uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Christine, and, and we certainly at SAF, it's been great to get to know you here and have you here. So it's certainly the school appreciates you being here as well. Thanks. Uh, and um, going off of the important discussion with, of course, uh, the women women's representation and how important it is, um, Winnie, as you were named uh, one of Women's Executive Network's top powerful women. Um, so you oh. were with this award. Congratulations again, and can't congratulate you enough. It's an incredible um, award. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were um, recognized as an outstanding woman, a uh, woman who advocates for workforce diversity and inspires the leaders of tomorrow and future leaders. Um, would you be able to discuss the uh, impact of that award and perhaps Christine and Winnie together, why celebrating women and their successes is so critical? Yeah, I, I would love to. I mean, first of all, I'm incredibly humbled even to be nominated and even more humbled to, 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 to have won this award. I mean, it's interesting because I'm not really the type of person who likes to be in the limelight. Like, I don't go after these awards, but um, I'm part of uh, the Women's Infrastructure Network, as, as you had mentioned, and we have an awards program. And participating in that awards program, you realize actually very quickly that it's not about winning the award. It's not about the winners that you know, having these award programs has a much broader impact with regards to gender diversity. And WXN has done a fantastic job participating in it and, and seeing them recognizing publicly women leaders. It starts to change society's mind about what leaders look like. You know, I certainly grew up in the generation and I'm sure a lot of us have this unconscious bias, you know, a leader is white male in their 50s, right? That's what you think. And until we actually address unconscious bias and it's not easy. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, oh, I, I, I'm thinking this. I should consciously not think this. You really have to subtly, you know, infiltrate, you know, the subconscious. And you do that by publicly recognizing and showcasing women leaders. And this is what they've done, you know, publicly showing what they've done and what they've done is is quite impressive. I mean, some of the women who've been selected in the top top 100 and that's really why these programs and these organizations like WXN and what I'm involved in W uh, the Women's Infrastructure Network is so important because we're really changing society's expectations on what leaders look like. If, and if I can jump in, I, I really um, strongly agree with that point. And it makes me think of some research at Harvard where uh, they look at unconscious bias and they do it in a way, you know, it's unconscious. So, you know, you have to answer questions quickly and it shows how biased you are. So it's in the, I think the initial studies were in the context of race. And the interesting thing was even um, Malcolm Gladwell, who is mixed race, had this strong unconscious bias against blacks. It's, you know, it is socialized. It's and 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 exactly what you said, Winnie, is that we think of leaders and in academia, we think of strong researchers as male, aggressive, white. And I do think one of the strongest ways that you can work against that is to profile and highlight successful women who are not, you know, male, are not necessarily white, um, you know, really show that these people have, it's not just um, speaking aggressively or interrupting people. Those are not necessarily the the characteristics that make you a good leader. And so highlighting that, um, and, and actually that study from Harvard, it, they discussed, you know, ways to counteract um, bias and, and sh uh, highlighting leaders sort of unexpected leaders was one of the points that they raised. So I think it's a really um, a really good way to, to make people aware that uh, lots of people can be leaders and they can be very good leaders. No, absolutely. I, I do think um, I think that is really important. I think that's a really, Christine, I really like that point with um, that it's not about women are capable of doing what that kind of stereotypical leader is like, but that it looks different to yes. be like being a leader and that still makes them a leader. And I think profiling that is very, very important. 
I mean, it's kind of an issue too, and we might get uh, to, at this point maybe later on, but you know, around something like hiring, I think one thing I've learned is it's really important when you're hiring prior to looking at any resumes or interviewing any candidates to state the kinds of skill sets that you're interested in. Because once you get into the process, you tend to say, oh, this guy, he's like me, like he, oh, he's great. Oh, he's going to be wonderful. But if you have this criteria of these are the kinds of skills that we're looking for, it's, it's a lot harder than to reject Jane for John because Jane may have even like be, be more qualified. And so that's like one way of, again, sort of countering the bias to say ex ante, what are the skills that we're looking for? Write, you know, document them first and then start looking at people. And then you have to evaluate those people relative to some objective list of criteria. Mm. Yeah, and I'd have to say, I mean, it's the importance of, you know, profiling, but also providing visible role models for society and also for the younger generation. So I have two young daughters um, and it's, it's it's wonderful. I'm hoping that I'm raising them in, in a society where they view everybody as having, you know, their own talents and, 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 and their abilities to achieve. But, you know, what's very encouraging to me and, you know, I certainly I, I hope that I serve as a role model to them um, is, uh, you know, they're lucky or I don't know if they're lucky. The circumstances are, you know, we have a family doctor that's female, you know, their allergist is female, their pediatrician is female. I remember this one time and I think my oldest was only five years old. I took them to a walk-in clinic on the weekend for some reason. And while we're waiting for the doctor, you know, my oldest goes to me, so, so mom, you know, can boys be doctors too? <laughs> and I just, it just brought such a big smile to my face and I actually, you know, paused. And I said, yeah, yeah, sometimes boys can be doctors, you know, <laughs> and and it's wonderful. Like it's very heartwarming to see, you know, that generation hopefully are growing up where they view both men and women are leaders, you know, and, 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 you know, through ethnic, you know, they see different ethnic um, diversity and then that's normal to see that, you know, everywhere. It's not, uh, you know, the leaders are men and the support roles are, are women. Absolutely, and I love that story, Winnie. <laughs> love that. Um, Christine, would you be able to talk a bit about the importance of research and how it can shape society and industry? And then you did a, a little bit with kind of the Harvard study, but um, anything else in the kind of importance of research? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, one thing actually that, um, caught my eye in just today's Globe and Mail and the opinion, like the letters to the editor, I want to draw that out because the point I wanted to make is the beauty of research is that it um, brings awareness to problems. So it doesn't solve the problems necessarily, but it makes you aware that there are problems um, and the extent of the problems. And what I, I reacted negatively to was this letter to the editor. It was uh, reacting to an article about uh, a pay gap, a gender pay gap, and a power gap in medicine. And a female doctor responded, and she said that it was a pipeline problem. Now you've got more women going into the field, like a, kind of relating to your point, Winnie. But then she said, well, women should do their jobs, do them well, and keep quiet. I believe the meritocracy will come through. And my blood pressure just went up when I read that because the thing is the meritocracy doesn't always come through because there are systematic um, institutional constraints, there are biases. Um, so for example, the study I did was looking at salary pay gap for accounting professors in Canada. So it was a, it was a you know, a, a, a very specialized, like looking at a very particular kind of academic, but the benefit of that is that you can hold all the, con all of the confounds constant. Like you can, um, you, you know, you can make sure that you're comparing apples with apples. So I, I observed a few things that I thought were interesting. First of all, whereas about 40 to 50% of assistant professors, new professors are female, at the full professor level, only 20% are female. So even though people like me have been going into this profession for 30 years, we're still not seeing equal representation, you know, equal representation at the top. Um, my study did find that women get paid less, controlling for factors that could explain differences. And interestingly, the pay gap was larger for women who are researching and actively publishing, which is sort of counterintuitive. And what I found was for every publication of the same quality, women have a lower return as it translates to salary than men do. 
And so in doing um, sort of additional analysis, what where the problem seems to lie is that when women work in co-authored teams, they seem to get less credit. Whereas when they work on their own or with other women, they get full credit. So evaluation committees may be downplaying their contributions because they're thinking that perhaps the male co-authors are contributing more. And similar research has been done on economists and the probability of getting tenure. And again, the, the, the increase in the probability of getting tenure for every additional publication is lower for women than it is for men. So it's not meritocracy. That's you know what a very clear outcome of this study is, that there are biases and you have to be aware of them and you have to kind of go out of your way to try to make sure that those biases aren't negatively impacting women. So I think the research, and I mean the research in terms of pay gap has found that to be true across the board. So it's, it's, a, it's a very prevalent finding. Yeah, I mean, from an industry perspective, I actually think research is extremely important to measure sort of, you know, gender representation at different levels and different disciplines and different industries, because I mean, certainly in the industry and, and it's true everywhere else, what gets measured gets done. You know, you can't set goals unless you have numbers. If you know what is your female representation, you can actually set a goal to do something and then having the research to back back that up and know which are the different areas that you need to work on. I mean, it's extremely important. I mean, the area of infrastructure is very male dominated. Um, same problem as academic, where we're starting to attract more women, even more female engineers into the field, you know, finance, legal, but you just don't see it at the senior leadership levels. And it's really trying to understand why and what can we do to support that? Is it, you know, systemic unconscious bias in the organization? Is it more society? I mean, there's huge discussions and articles about how, you know, women still, despite their high powered careers, are the primary caregivers. And when the child gets sick, when something happens, it's really hard during the COVID period. You know, they're the ones who have to take a back step in their career in order to take on that role. And it's really what can society do to support that? How can we change the mindset of the role even in the home of who takes primary responsibility so that everybody succeeds? But research is critical. And, and one of the things in infrastructure that I'd really like to advocate for in my role of Women's Infrastructure Network is having more research in the industry on, on, on gender diversity. The engineers have done a really good job and they've set certain goals of having certain percentage representation, but we need to go more. I mean, it's cross-disciplinary and really bringing that together and understanding what the issues so that you know, an organization like Women's and Infrastructure can advocate in the right way to different organizations and government for policy changes and that type of thing. Yeah, and, and kind of connecting to that point, Winnie, um, I know uh, in Ontario, the Ontario Securities Commission now has a comply or explain requirement for corporations that they have to uh, discuss their uh, the percentage of female board representation and um, it, and and discuss any kind of goals or or policies they have to increase that representation or explain why they don't have that and i think one aspect that you mentioned which i believe is probably very important is stating the goal stating the targets like not all companies are doing that but my sense is if you state this is where we want to be i would imagine that will help companies get there faster rather than just saying very generically, yes, we want to in increase representation. I, another thing I just want to throw in a quote, because it's, it's one of my favorite statistics, and not a quote, but a statistic, and that is when you look at uh, the CEOs, so this is sort of high, high level leadership in S&P 500 companies, the same percentage of men named John as the, there is the percentage of women. So they're both about 5%. About 5% of CEOs are women and about 5% are men named John. <laughs> so, you know, again, it kind of it highlights uh, that we've got a ways to go. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. And that is a, um, a daunting stat. Um, that definitely is one to, uh, it's, I do laugh at it, but then you think about it and it's, it's, it's not funny. But it's very, it's very real because it's so. It's just that's a that's a yeah. Again, daunting stat, um, really. Um, 
In uh, Winnie, I know that you are, as you had mentioned and how we had talked about, the founding, uh, you had found the Women's Infrastructure Network and are actively part of that. Um, and Christine, I know through your research role, your past um, experiences um, in the firms and also with our alumni um, and a lot of events, uh, would you uh, be able to discuss um, either to start the powerful role of networking that you uh, have and what you think the networking role takes in advancing uh, gender equity? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go first. Um, mm -hmm. you no, know, I think networking is actually very important. I mean, certainly, I think when I first started in my career, that was something that I was very apprehensive about. You sort of view it as, you know, giving your business card and getting business and you know, it's a big, it, it, and that's totally not what networking is about at all. Um, you know, and it's, it, it actually plays the Women's Infrastructure Network and all of organizations that have network actually provide a very strong role, particularly, you know, the women's organizations in, in advancing gender equity because you know there's one voice you know there's my voice talking about gender equity if you bring a network together and you're all saying the same thing all of a sudden you have a powerful voice and you you can be heard right and so since we've started the women's infrastructure network about 10 years ago i mean we now have the attention of some of the biggest infrastructure companies uh, in the industry and they actively want to be associated with the Women's Infrastructure Network or they've started their own gender equity programs in there. We've gotten, you know, the um, attention of the government, um, certainly the prior Trudeau government, you know, the Ministry of Infrastructure, uh, Minister McKenna was a very active supporter of Women's Infrastructure Network, it spoke at it, you know, has met with us to talk about potential policy changes that can be made in government procurement in order to afford gender equity. We couldn't have done that as individuals, you know, brought together, we're a network, we are a powerful voice, you know, a combination of, of women of various influence and various various network connections themselves have, have enabled us to do that. But, you know, even on a very personal level to know that you're not alone. I mean, even now, 20 years later, quite often I go to a meeting and I'm the only female at it. I don't know why. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Why? And so if I didn't have a network, I would think that what I'm thinking and what I'm experiencing, I'm the only one experiencing it. But when you talk to other people and other women in the industry, you realize, hey, we're all experiencing the same things. And this is this, you know, the, the system needs to change and we need to advocate for it. And also, I mean, you know, men, maybe they're more they're better at networking and opening doors, but having that network and having access to everybody else's network and being very supportive, it helps your own career. You know, it, it uh, opens up mentorship opportunities, support opportunities, and, you know, and role models. Like some of the people that I am on the steering committee with are some of the most, you know, prominent and, and important women in infrastructure. And I look at them and I say, if they can do that, I can do it too. And without that sort of context, you know, you're limited in your own small world and you're not able to kind of move forward. So I'm a huge advocate of, of, of networking and belonging to a, to a network. I, I think that's so important. I would agree. And I think that idea of, again, seeing females in leadership positions um, really gives you that sense of, like you said, Winnie, I can do this. You know, I, you know, I can, I, she's doing it. That means I can do it. And I do find also the idea of um, not feeling like you're alone. And I, like, for example, the women in accounting and finance event that SAF does, I found that's been really interesting to hear other women and their experiences because it does feel, make you feel like you're not alone. And it gives you some ideas about how you can uh, deal with issues. So it's a good a mentoring opportunity. Um, and uh, and and you also you know can can make some good connections. I think in the academic world too, um, the mentoring is important. So you have you know senior. There are now more senior females. Again, not as many as I think there should be, but uh, they can certainly um, mentor. And you know, part of the issues you know we kind of say, well, what, you know, what's the problem? And part of the issue is institutional. Part of it is bias, and part of it also is women's own. Um, tendencies, and this is not meant in a negative way at all, because this describes me 
very well. And I think it, um, and of course, not all women are the same, so it doesn't describe all women. But for example, we know from research that women are much less likely to self-promote. They're not as strong in negotiations. Um, and so they're, these are skills that we can learn. And certainly, at first, it was very difficult for me to promote myself, to talk about my accomplishments or, um, you know, to apply for funding and to, you know, to sort of toot my own horn. But you realize that if you don't do this, you're going to miss opportunities because all of your male colleagues just do this as a matter of course. So I think we can also teach women how to do these kinds of things, perhaps in a way that they'll feel comfortable with even for example you, you know we are tend to be interrupted more than men well maybe if you can teach them how to deal with those interruptions you know show them how you might uh, model responses not getting angry but trying to deal with it in a very professional way like these are all things that you know could potentially help as well so yeah absolutely i think mentoring and having a network of women that you can um you can relate to, you can look up to, that you can learn from is really critical. Yeah, I actually love your point about, you know, how women tend to, you know, be timid about self-promotion and speaking up and, you know, and it's not, not only just mentoring other women. So we have a, a, a mentoring uh, program in the Women's Infrastructure Network. And, you know, more recently, we've been having some serious conversations about getting men to come in and mentor women because, you know, a lot of the things that men unconsciously do, like in meetings, like interrupting, mansplaining, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. I mean, they don't realize they're doing it. Yeah. And, you know, having them actually mentor young women and seeing, you know, some of the challenges they're saying, you know, the, the hope is that it starts changing their behavior and start being a little bit more aware about their unconscious actions that might, you know, um, impinge upon, you know, gender diversity. Um, so, you know, having that network to say, hey, I'm not alone, you know, I, I'm having problems because I always get interrupted and to know that that's you know, a theme that other people have as well, too, then learning skills to kind of overcome that or to manage that and also to bring awareness to the male counterparts that yes. hey, you're doing something. You don't realize you're doing it. Yes. Yeah, again, that awareness. That can go a long way, too. Absolutely. Another thing is that, you know, it, related to this, it, women tend to undervalue their own contributions. So that means that whenever you ask someone to self-evaluate, women may hurt themselves in that process because they're more likely to be more humble, maybe more realistic, you know, and, and say, these are my, okay, yeah, I have strengths, but these are my faults, whereas men may not uh, do that. So again, like making people aware that, you know, this is, this is what's happening is definitely mm -hmm. helpful, yeah. And figuring out how to deal with it. I mean, on yes. the same point, another example you see on the resume, you know, if a male and a female have the same experience, the man you read his resume he says he's led the team. He's the one who single-handedly solved this problem. You read the same thing on a women's resume. It's like, I was part of a team that solved this. I supported yeah. this. Like, it's very different, but maybe yes. what they've done is the same. Yes. So it is sort of changing that mindset and being, yeah, and encouraging, you know, if you have a network that yes. encourages to you to, you to self-promote. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And even, I, you know, I know with a lot of my undergraduate female students, I would sometimes take them aside and say, do you realize that you're ending your sentence with a question mark, like that in inflection at the end of the sentence that makes it sound like you're not sure of what you're saying? And you are obviously extremely bright and know exactly what you're saying, like little things like that. And I, you know, of course, you have to do it at the right time or, you know, sense whether that's appropriate or not, but trying to make sure that uh, you know, women are are helping themselves as well um, is, is important, but it's difficult because we're socialized to be a, a certain way and those uh, tendencies run deep. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, in terms of mentoring and so forth, I mean, that's exactly it, providing sort of that that frank feedback to say, did you yes. know that you end your sen sentences that way? It, yes. it, it makes it sound like you're unclear, but to be able to do that. And I mean, 
you know, and I'm a huge advocate of mentor mentorship. I've had lots of mentors, formal and informal. My career has helped me. I've had, you know, at KPMG, I've had like senior managers, partners who literally take me aside, said, Winnie, you know, let's let's talk about what's going on. Like you're being overlooked. You know what's going on here, and you know that's been very very valuable. And having access to a network that allows you to form formal and informal. Like I've had a lot of people I've reached out to where I'm like, I just need advice on this one off problem and you know they'll mentor me for you know a couple months or maybe only one session and then I go off and I'm fine but you know it's that type of support that have allowed me to 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 get to where I am today. Absolutely this discussion has been fantastic and I think it's also kind of left off a lot of um, great tips um, for young women that are seeing this um, advice for them advice not all even not just young women but how all of us in the industry can make a difference empower women um, and be a part of making that change so I think this discussion has been fantastic of um, laying out those kind of things and across industries um, in you are in infrastructure work uh, Winnie and Christine in research but this is certainly applicable across um, all industries all work so I think that's fantastic. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to see if there's anything, Winnie, Christine, that you wanted to add in terms of, Christine, um, more of your, uh, any of your research that you perhaps wanted to add some more information on or anything if, like that? Well, if I could just add very quickly that um, there's a McKinsey study that uh, they do a study every year and um, the most recent study, it shows that the situation for women has gotten worse under COVID. So I, I do want to make that point. And Winnie, I'm sure you've observed this well uh, as well, that we see that, you know, the, the burden of caregiving and housework is higher for women in normal times. Even when you look at professional couples that do the same thing. Um, women do hours more per week on average than men. Uh, this has been exacerbated during COVID because of lack of uh, being able to send your kids to school, being able to access daycare, uh, grandparents couldn't come and help anymore, like all kinds of restrictions. And so the study has found that um, women ha have been feeling more burnt out than uh, a year ago and that their increase in burnout has been significantly higher for women than for men. Um, another thing uh, that hasn't come up, I'll just say very briefly, is that women tend to bear greater responsibility for the um, uh, corporate and academic family. That, so that is doing service work, providing emotional support to people. And again, this has ramped up during COVID. And again, it probably falls more often on women's plates than on men's. Um, and so we're seeing a higher departure rate for women than for men than normal. And so, um, you know, it, it's just really important. All, everything that we've been talking about and everything that we've been working towards for years, we've seen a setback in the last two years, really upsetting uh, and, and frustrating. And so um, I think it just um, it's just something to bear in mind that, you know, that these problems have not gone away and COVID certainly has exacerbated some of them. Yeah, I mean, I would I would totally agree with all of that <laughs> and I certainly uh, have observed it. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to have these conversations and to bring awareness about that so that change could happen. And, and I guess one other thing it, relating to that is uh, revisit evaluation methods during COVID. Um, and, and a colleague of mine and I, Ranjini Jha and I went to speak to the uh, Faculty Association and for 2020, the university did amend its evaluation procedures, giving people more options that they could opt out of being evaluated for certain aspects of their performance that might have been impacted by COVID. Unfortunately, they're not doing it for 2021, but that's one other way of when you look at um, promotion mm -hmm. for tenure or you know promotion in the corporate setting and uh, annual performance evaluation, it's thinking of ways ways uh, that you can make sure that people aren't being penalized for the disproportionate um, damage they've suffered through COVID than other people. 
Yeah, and then another thing that you said earlier about, you know, even in the corporate organization where women take the disproportionate role of sort of more traditional caregiving roles, like the administration, the HR, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's usually the women that have to take on the HR duties as there isn't a dedicated HR department, you know, the administration, like getting like Christmas cards sent to the staff or presents, you know, it always falls on, on the women. And, and it's not something that I think men consciously do to assign it and maybe women kind of more volunteer because they realize something needs to be done but I think there needs to be a more conscious you know assignment of those responsibilities because it's really it, it does damage to to, to sort of the, the, the equity of, of, of or, you know our gender goals. That was all the time that we had for today uh, but thank you both so much. Uh, it was a really insightful conversation. It was fantastic to have you both here. Um, and there's a lot of important takeaways, a lot of important um, points that were discussed. And I just can't thank you both enough. Um, and congratulations again, Winnie, on uh, the award. Congratulations, Winnie.